What I wanted to talk about is the covert forms of racism. Good. Because I feel like white people have a tendency, and I don't want to group everybody together, but there is a tendency to think, well, I'm not a racist. I don't call anyone the N-word. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything like that. That's very overt. But there's such strong covert forms of racism. And the story that I want to talk about is high school chemistry class. Yet attitude means, how can I proactively change the way I think? How can I proactively increase my life? How can I proactively create better relationships and better work situations for me to enjoy it? And welcome to the GAP, the Get Attitude podcast, The Gap. Bridging the gap from who you are to who you want to become and from where you are to where you want to go. Hello, my name is Glenn Bill. I am the founder of the University of Attitude keynote speaker and author of the number one international best-selling book, The ABCs of Attitude, and I've been fortunate enough to help tens of thousands of people get attitude. Attitude is the secret formula to success in your business and in your life, and this podcast is going to help you get yours. So, let's get some. <music> I want to welcome everybody. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Follow us on our Facebook pages at the Get Attitude Podcast at the University of Attitude. Also on Twitter at U of Attitude and LinkedIn at Glenn Bill. And uh, it's just great to be here with uh, four of my oldest friends. And this is a historic podcast. We are calling this the 846 Interviews. The 846 Interviews. And in light of of all the things that have been going on, I was pondering over the past 10 days, uh, what is it that I am supposed to be doing? I've prayed about it. I've watched uh, the leaders on TV. I've watched the interviews. And uh, the one thing that came clear to me was doing nothing is not an option. And so uh, as I pondered and prayed, uh, this was my solution. This is my part uh, to give the voice to the people uh, that... Uh, need to share their stories and I want to share the stories of black men around America in what we call an eight minute and 46 second interview. Uh, on May 25th our country changed not because of what happened because that's been going on for a while but our country changed and George Floyd was publicly killed in an event which was filmed and witnessed for everyone to see in real time. He was unable to breathe and tortured for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, unable to speak what was on his mind, haunting all of us to make us come to grips with that time frame of his suffering. We are honoring him and what he went through and his family with the 8 minute and 46 second interview. He was unable to breathe and tortured for that amount of time, unable to speak what was on his mind. These 8 minute and 46 second interviews are meant to help us all grasp the amount of time that George Floyd suffered and to give a voice to his black brothers and black sisters for that amount of time in which he could not express his feelings and his words. These, like I said, are four dear longtime friends of mine. Uh, we will first, that they will first be able to express their feelings in this time frame in order to discuss their race history their thoughts on change, and their advice for the future. I suggest to uh, all my white friends and fellow white people that when we try to understand the uh, concept of black, court, uh, black culture and the concept of what do we do and what do we say, that you start with the people you know first, that you start with the people you have known the longest. Because what I believe is that we all need to feel safe. And what I am wanting to do in this and today's podcast is to create a safe environment, uh, not just for them, but for us and for everyone who is listening. My hope is that we come out of this with a better understanding of the black story, with real solutions and ideas and thoughts on how to change things at a local level, and with ideas and thoughts on how to improve our lives and the lives of others. This podcast is meant to get you thinking, right? Attitude is the way you dedicate yourself to the way you think. And the more we can create attitude alignment when it comes to race, the more and the better chance we have to improve things around us. So we're going to start 
uh, our eight minute and 46 second interviews uh, with uh, the one and only George Nolan. Now, I, I wanna just, first of all, in, uh, introduce all my guests. Uh, we have George Nolan, we have Raphael Coffey, Todd Fennell, and Alan Halliburton, all uh, gentlemen who I've known for a while. So George, we're gonna start with you. Good to see you, I love that smile. It hasn't changed, my man. Thank you, good, I'm um, excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to have conversations that are so important. Um, I- given what we experience every day as black men and being able to share our stories is wonderful. I thank you for the platform. Fantastic. And so Jason, we'll start the clock after this introduction. George and I went to grade school. I've known George since I've been in first grade. That puts us at about 30, 43 years uh, of knowing each other. He's been a 20 plus year uh, educator and, and uh, leadership educator as director, principal, assistant principal, dean of students, and equity coordinator, turnaround educator committed to rigor and relevance for all students, strongly believes that it does take a village and a school to raise a scholar hope dealer. George has the unique experience of literally being around the corner from ground zero uh, of what occurred. So, uh, George, it's time for us to start our interview. Go ahead and start that clock. Uh, Jason, thank you, Jason Joloff and Studio J for producing and being here with us. You able to get it going? Very good. Okay, so George, what we want to do, uh, as we talked about, was to hear your race story. I believe that when we, uh, when we look and engage with uh, the black community, we shouldn't only just see a black man, but I believe that every black man ha- and woman has a story, a story that changed them forever, a story of real racism, racism, whether experienced personally or someone in their family. Could you please share with us your racism story and uh, so we can feel and understand uh, what's inside of you? Um, thank you for having me, black men. It's great to be here to share our stories. Um, primarily growing up in Indianapolis, you know, it was it was an interesting area in Indianapolis. And as you know, Indianapolis, Indiana is probably one of the most racist um, areas um, that um, a person of color can um, grow in. But at the same time, there was a holistic approach from the African American community that was very supportive. Um, I remember um, listening to the old uh, Negro spiritual anthem, um, uh, national anthem, excuse me, um, growing up, um, being in um, elementary. um, I remembered some of those stories of, you know, uh, watching the cops and how they were um, handling and working with some of the people that are African-American community. Um, But I think the first with all that being said, the first experience I remember growing up on Carrollton Avenue, 51st and Carrollton, was I remember there was a being young and and a family that um, was white that was down the street. You know, as a, you know, we had all kinds of fun as on the neighborhood blocks. We would do some fun things and and things like that. But I remember specifically going um, with this uh, going down the street and hearing a parent yell for a white parent yell at their kids saying come home and so that was fine i get it but what had happened was with that is i heard you know i don't want you hanging with those ends and so i'm little and i'm young and i'm like oh wow you know and i think i was about seven at the time Mm. and just remembering some of that 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 pieces right there kind of like started to like okay what was this about because we were playing and I remember the, the families and the parents were somewhat receptive, but then all of a sudden they felt it was casual and okay to say that. Um, and so that was kind of my first experience with it. Um, but growing up, always having to uh, worry about, you know, how fast you're driving. Um, when I became, uh, when I started and got my driver's license, um, the interactions that we've had. Um, fortunately, um, my relationship with you um, has been very positive. You know, we, you know, we kind of like knew each other. We grew up. Um, there was no, there was no um, issues that way. But I can't say that for 
you know, my whole, whole overall experience at uh, Indianapolis. But, you know, it's it, it was a good base for me to understand collectively what, you know, being a bigot and a racist, what that was all about. Um, so, you know, that kind of, you know, kind of got me, uh, allowed me to be grounded in understanding the, the intensity of sometimes dealing with race and, and not knowing difference. So that kind of gave me a, a balance on that. Tell me about, uh, just take me back to being seven, um, because again, I mean, this is what I don't think people get. Uh, being called an N-word at seven by a bunch of white neighbors. Tell me what was happening inside. What was the feeling in your gut? I mean, did it did it resonate? Did it shake you? Do you re- you, you got to remember the feeling. Just clue me in a little bit to more, like, what was the feeling and in, in, in how was it for you? I mean, it was it was hurt. I mean, because, you know, you had a relationship with the, the kid and it's, they seemed cool. Um, they the family seemed, you know, accepting. But when you hear that and was a casual converse, I mean, it was casual. It was just like, boom, right out the mouth. It's like, OK, and the seven, you know, it, it was a struggle because I was trying to figure out those boundaries and what that was about. And, 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 you know, there was some anger, but at the same time, I was just like, I was too young to kind of know the, uh, understand the importance of what that means. Interesting. So I want to go to our second question. If you could create instant change, what would that be? What would that look like to you in terms of legislation, police interaction or procedure, prosecutorial process, or inherent bias? I know there's a lot, just pick one, but like, are there one or two things that if you could be king of America that you could change tomorrow, especially dealing with kids in the educational system, what would that be, George? I think I think the more we can provide academic opportunities for and build empathy for our kids in the community. I mean, we have white men who grow up who've never been exposed to what it is to be empathetic. And so... They don't understand the history. They don't understand, in some aspects, they do, but it's always centered on their existence. And so they've never been, especially pre-K, we don't have opportunities or push African-American history and what that looks like. And it's not, you know, it's not put in their, their daily lives to understand the struggle. And so there's a sense of uh, being naive to the struggle and there's a sense of not understanding the struggle and what it means. Coalesce with how do we educate our families and kids about the importance of education and how important that is and making sure that we address the inequities that we have not only in the education field but also in the social emotional field and what happens in society. Um, if I was, my blue sky world is, is that everybody um, that walks through the door clearly understands that we all have something to share. And I always use this as a buffet. You know, I'm a big guy, I like to eat, but I've always thought it's important to have people come to share their, what the, and bring something to the table to share with everybody. And so I would say the more we can educate, build empathy and support um, all of our kids that way, the better. What do you think white people need to do or what do they need to hear? I know when, when I wrote to you, I know, I know white guys that were like, I didn't even know a black guy till I was 10. I didn't even meet one or say hello to one. So what do white people need to hear or what do they need to do in your eyes? They need to understand that it's, it, you know, we are immigrants, that's one. Number two is, is that the black male and the black person has contributed to our society in ways that has not been shared with people. They don't understand who built the White House. They don't understand some of those components about our collective um, um, contribution to society. And I think, again, what happens in education, we separate kids, and so they don't have the chance to, you know, to you know, be a part of the process and understand our school system is polarized we separate kids all the time. And so if you go into a lunchroom, you'll see white kids over here, black kids over there, but they don't understand. They don't want to understand. And so how you build that empathy for they can understand and build those relationships that are important. 
But then also from a legal standpoint, we have to change how we approach people. When and how are we going to approach people in a way that is all about being respectful and kind and generous? As an American society, we fail in that area. And so it's tough. It is tough. Do you feel that there is still hope uh, that things can change and is the time now to make that happen? And we're back. All right, George, thank you for that eight minutes and 46 seconds. I don't know if you realize that we froze that, but we did what we said we would do. So yep. God bless you and thank you for, uh, number one, leading our young people. And, um, and I know that if your magic is uh, with the students up in Minnesota, um, things are definitely going to be better than if you weren't there. So uh, that was really great. I want to go... Now to my second oldest friend who I met probably back in 1976. He's an Indianapolis native, 30-year career in IT with a major corporation, 32-year member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, Inc., and immediate past president of the Indianapolis Alumni Chapter, 20-year football coach of grade school, high school, and college men. First met me, like I said, back in 1970-something. Todd Fennell, come on up in here. Hey, Glenn, how you doing, my brother? All right, all right. Good to uh, be with you. Thank you so much. What I want to uh, do is the same thing we did with George, and then after I start the question, you can start the clock to give Todd enough time. Todd, what we want you to do is share your personal or shared racism experience. How old were you when you experienced that, and how did it make you feel? Ready, go, Jason. Yeah, Glenn, so, uh, you know, you, you reached out and invited me to participate in this uh, podcast. I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to have this dialogue with you and with others. Um, didn't really hesitate to tell you yes to it. I know I asked a few questions, but really didn't hesitate to uh, ex accept the offer. And and what I'll say up front uh, is, number one, I've, I've lived and have had a very blessed life. Um, have, have grown up in, um, you know, multicultural neighborhood, um, multicultural schools, uh, things of that nature. Uh, let me say up front, my grandfather was an Indianapolis police officer. I've got a cousin who was on IMPD. Um, and I've got a ton of friends as we speak right now, good friends who are police officers in one form or fashion. Um, so, so there's there's nothing uh, in in what I'm sharing here or what I'm speaking about here that is specific to all cops or anything of that nature. It's, I think it's very important for us to understand um, that just like people, there are good people and bad people. There are good cops and bad cops. the 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 one story I would share with you, however, does have to do with a police officer, um, and it had happened when I was probably 16 or 17 years old. Um, I grew up, like I said, multicultural neighborhood, Butler Tarkington, 51st and Capitol. Um, I didn't grow up in the hood. I don't know what it means to live in the hood. So I, I, I can't speak about that experience. Nonetheless, nonetheless, one summer evening, um, I was walking home from a friend's house. It was dark outside. Um, and I got, Glenn, if you recall where I live, I, I got to my house on the corner of Capitol and Beverly. Yeah. And I was beginning to walk down the hill to my house. Police car rolled up and without making the story too long, he detained me in front of my house mm. for about 10 to 15 minutes. He didn't put me in cuffs or anything like that. Didn't ask me, you know, any, any kind of questions, uh, but just detained me and was harassing me. And I pleaded with him, Hey man, man, let me just go to the door and get my dad. Let, let, let me just help you understand that this is my house that you are detaining me in front of. Mm. Let, let me go get my dad so we can get this all squared away. Mm. Right. Eventually, you know, he, he went on about his business, never did allow me to go up uh, and, and, and get to my parents. But as soon as he rolled away, 
I went into the house and just basically exploded with with my dad saying, you know, how does something like this happen? I'm a good kid. I don't I don't get into bad stuff. I wasn't doing anything. Why did he do that? Right. So, you know, Glenn, I'm 53 years old today. Um, Happy birthday. Uh, like and, today? And not today. Oh, OK. I'm 53, <laughs> 53 years old now. OK. I got um, you. But but yet and still, when I was 16 or 17 years old, this is still a vivid memory in my mind, mm. in my heart and in my soul. Right. Right. And, and, and so it's it's the, it's I, I, I could tell several similar stories. Right. Um, but but that's that's what we live with. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, what I feel, I feel what that story did to your nervous system. And sure. I, I think when um, people that haven't hung around black guys or people that don't understand the story of blacks, and I'm not putting myself up on a pedestal at all, because I have limited references compared to most white people, I'm sure. But what I, what I don't think, and, I, and I, I was thinking about Drew Brees and all the trouble he got in. I, I don't, and, and Lord knows he knows plenty of black people, but these stories get in the nervous system of the black culture. And, and that's what I don't think people see. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I could tell that it still affects your nervous system when you tell that story. So now I want to make you uh, king, of, king of America and somebody that could uh, quickly create instant change uh, in legislation, police interaction procedural, prosecutorial process, or inherent bias. What would you change if you could right now that would uh, help? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in, in, in my mind, um, there, there's a couple of things we could look at. I'm, I'm sure there's tons of things. A couple of things that immediately come to my mind have to do more or so with um, policing. Mm. Um, since, since that's really what has uh, been such uh, uh, a challenge for, for us um, in, in the black community. Uh, again, not all cops are bad. Some are good. Some are bad. Um, but but two things come to mind, and and I'll, I'll say up front here, I, I'm I'm not familiar with with laws uh, uh, to to any significant extent uh, to 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 know if something is or is not in place. Uh, but but the first thing that comes to mind is you know at the end of the day, murder is murder. Um, and the unjust killing of any human being, black, white, brown, purple, pink, or blue, the, the unjust killing of any uh, human being must be taken as it occurs. And, and, and there can't be any special dispensations because you do or don't have a badge. Um, you, you need to be treated and, and held accountable for the crime that has occurred. Mm -hmm. So murder is murder. So I don't I don't know what kind of laws are or are not in place related to what happens. What 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 is the course of justice when a police officer is involved? But I would look in that space. Secondly, um, I, I I honestly believe that body cams for all police officers should be mandatory. Mm -hmm. You know, we we can talk about how much it costs and things like that. But if you think about what we spend, what other types of things we spend money on. Um, I, I think there's probably fair justification to to say, yeah, we, we need to be spending money here on body cams for all police officers instead of elsewhere. Right. So, so those are a couple of thoughts that I have. And, and uh, of course, the, the body cams, I forget the most recent uh, tragedy, but of course, the body cams are off when when it when it occurred. Let's uh, let me ask. Let me ask you this question. What do you think white people need to do or what do they need to hear? Yeah, so um, I, I think first and foremost, um, white folks need to understand that white privilege is real. We, we're, we're not gonna argue on that point. White privilege is real. Mm -hmm. um, number two, I, I think if white people wanna make a difference, the first thing they need to do is listen for understanding and not listen to be baking your reply, mm -hmm. right? So I think Covey said, listen first to understand, then to be understood. Sure, You gotta understand the plight, understand the situation, understand the background before you can even take the first step in figuring out how you can help. Um, and, and then number three, um, and, and I really think this is not just white people, this is everybody. 
at the end of the day, it starts in your heart, your heart. Mm -hmm. You have to start with yourself, right? So when Jesus was asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? His response was, love thy neighbor. Right. That's the first and most important. So if you don't start there, if you can't get yourself there, then that's a whole different conversation, Glenn. And yeah, you just, and, and again, you wonder uh, where that seed is sown and where that seed is grown. And um, it, it certainly people don't come out uh, with these uh, thoughts and with these feelings. They are planted and watered. And, um, and proximity is a bitch. Tell me this, what, uh, what's the best advice you could give to the younger generation of black kids? I would say it's it's a matter of responding versus reaction. It's it's a matter of rational thinking versus irrational uh, reaction to situations. And when you think of um, when you think of the best way to respond. All right, we're back with the eight minutes or the eight seconds of uh, silence to remember George Floyd. I hope everybody's getting the grasp as we're communicating uh, our messages and our guests are communicating your, their messages. That's as long as that guy had his knee on George's neck. I mean, crazy. The, the thought of that is crazy. And this is why we're doing this to drive that home and, and to just to put yourself in that place of sheer terror and fear. Um, to me, it shakes me at the core. The uh, next guest that we have is a dear friend of mine, Raphael Coffey. Raphael is a father, husband, disabled veteran, black man, as he put on his thing. I love that. And he is also an attorney. So maybe we can get some legal uh, thoughts from you, coach. And I know that you've done a lot in the employment area of uh, discrimination and that type of thing. But we want you to talk from your heart and uh, we're, we'll start the clock uh, when I get done with the first question. So uh, Raphael and I have known each other since freshman year in high school, since we've been 14. And um, like I said, he's a dear friend, just like a brother to me. So Raphael, um, I do wanna hear your personal or shared racism experience story when you when it first were you like holy moly uh this is not i can't believe this how old were you how did it make you feel why don't you share that with me well first and foremost i want to thank you for inviting me sure to participate um a couple things you know one what todd said was pretty profound because i've known you and todd since 1982. <laughs> 38 years pushing 40 years that, uh, that's a long time it's a month of sundays so right. to speak um, and it was pretty profound because Todd, he shared a story where he was detained by a police officer and he, he prefaced by saying he was a good kid. Right. And I want to, I want to co-sign with you. Todd was a real good dude, still is. Mm -hmm. And one of, he was a class ahead of us. Right. But you were one of the guys that when I was a young, impressionable high school student, I kind of looked up to you. I thought you were going to tell a story about your old green Chevy. Uh, <laughs> and I, I thought the story was going to have something to do with that. But nevertheless, um, this is a guy that was doing all the right things, and it still happened to him. Right. Um, in terms of the first um, episode, I'm not really going to say, I'm not really going to go into that. You know, I'll, I'll just say that similar to Todd, um, when I was um, a kid, we were ensconced in middle class. My mother was a teacher. My father worked at the post office. We did not live in the hood. Mm -hmm. um, multicultural. And, and then I can go a step further. My parents were rural people from Tennessee. They bought 10 acres outside of Noblesville. Right. When I was probably seven, eight years old. <clears throat> so I can assure you that Noblesville, Helena County was not the way that it is now. Not quite as diverse. So that it's, would have been the... It's diverse now? Oh, uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I know Hamilton Southeastern and Fishers High School look very different than when my brothers went there. Okay, okay. Um, but I can tell you, there were instances out there mm -hmm. from other kids. Um, and, you know, 
I know the first time I, I got in a fight. Right. I was probably eight years old. Mm-hmm. You know, little kid on the football field, and we're fighting. And then another time, then there were a few other episodes as I got into playing baseball um, in high school. You'd hear cat calls from from a distance. Wow. And you know, my thoughts there were just. Wow, and are you going to be offended if I use an expletive or two? No, I want you to. That's Good. why this is a podcast. Right. Well, and, yeah, that's I, right. I want it. Look, at this is safe. This is raw yeah. and real. And I want to know when, because you are a temperamental black man. So I, I want to know when you were pissed <laughs> off and what oh, caused it. That's so, what I want to know. So in high school, when it would happen, it was probably because I was putting in work on the baseball field. And I thought, you're a little piece of shit because you're scared. <laughs> if you're going to say that, be have enough backbone to say it to me. Right. But I really kind of got off track. What I wanted to talk about is the covert forms of racism. Good. Because I feel like white people have a tendency, and I don't want to group everybody together, but there is a tendency to think, well, I'm not a racist. I don't call anyone the N-word. Mm-hmm. I don't do anything like that. That's very overt. But there's such strong covert forms of racism. And the story that I want to talk about is high school chemistry class. Let's do it. And the teacher on more than one occasion accused me of che- cheating off of some of the people that sat around me. Mm-hmm. And I can assure you that was not the case. Right. They were looking on my right. paper. But it, it simply is this mindset of I've got white people here and I've somehow got black people. They're in a lesser state. They're lesser people. Mm-hmm. They're less intelligent there's such this strong tendency to um, attach negative stereotypes to people of color. Right. All day, every day. And that was something, and, and I know that that episode in high school chemistry class, it really pissed me off. I kind of, I kind of, uh, I didn't really laugh it off, but I just thought, once again, you don't even have any idea right. what those words mean to someone. And it didn't, it didn't, um, make me cry in my cornflakes, but I just thought, you know what, this is just another example. Right. Now that's 30, that's 35 years ago. Sure. But that, I can assure you that that type of thing is happening right now. All day. Mm-hmm. All day, every day. And it doesn't matter if it's athletics, academics, occupational, or out here, George Floyd walking the streets. Right, right. Well then, let, and so let's, let's bridge into that because, uh, and you may not want to go here, but if you could change, <clears throat> right, a law, prosecution, uh, police interaction, or, you know, again, uh, racism on the job, which I know you, you were in. T- talk yeah. to me about one or two, like, un- like Glenn, if this would just happen, do you know what? If we could get this to happen, this could make a difference quick. Well, I mean, we could talk about sentencing guidelines. We could talk about um, police wearing um, um, video cams. Mm-hmm. They'll probably turn them off, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, But I think it's important to talk about being receptive to having this conversation. Right. Because I think a lot of people, as I as I alluded to, they they think of themselves as, hey, I'm open minded. I've never done anything to exhibit any sort of racist behavior. But yet there it is. And Mm -hmm. that's that point of white privilege. Um, I think it is kind of an umbrella that everything falls below. Mm-hmm. The great example you brought up, Drew Brees, is, you know, Laura Ingram is on Fox News. Oh, yeah. And um, let's just say not a fan <laughs> for a variety of reasons. We'll, so, t- we'll tweet her after the show, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so when LeBron James says he makes a comment in 2018, right? basically what she was saying is, hey, black boy, take your basketball and go dribble. Right. But when Drew Brees makes a comment right. relative to race in 2020, oh, he has First Amendment rights. He should be able to speak his truth mm-hmm. and, and, and shouldn't be judged for it. Right. But that is the type of thing that I think all of these gentlemen have felt in some form or fashion. I know I have. And, and that's the point of the show. <clears throat> you know, the, the point of the show is um, you're just not black people. You're black people with a deep inbred story in your nervous system, which we don't have. 
and which we don't know, which we haven't heard. And that's why I think it's important that we bring these stories out. We can act like we know them, but have we sat down and felt them with our brothers and sisters? And, when, you know, when when uh, Todd helped me with the question, you know, what, what do white people need to do or hear? And, and white people are very defensive when it comes to grouping you all, all the white people together. And, and I want to I want to piggyback onto that. Because I want to know. That notion. I want to know. Well, it's well, I haven't done anything to you. Right. But in the next book, I always like to refer to some people as well-intentioned white people. They're not like out here just hating on you. No. Right. But they'll say things like, wow, he's so smart for black kids. <laughs> or wow, he speaks so well for a black kid. Boy, he's not an athlete like you'd think. <laughs> right. And it's not <laughs> On meant, the other side. Right. It's not meant to be a criticism or a slight. Mm -hmm. But if the person who is being given the so-called compliment is really listening, Right. That's absolutely what it is. And I know that white kids, there, there are no white kids that somebody said, oh, he's so smart or speaks so well for a white kid. Right. But this is, this is the type of thing where people just have to be receptive to listening versus getting in a defensive posture. Which they do. Absolutely. There's and especially no if the conversation veers over into politics and Ooh. the president administration and all that. We don't have no time for that. But <laughs> then it gets, well, just because I support the president, I'm not a racist. Well, don't support someone that espouses racist beliefs. Right. All right, my man, Raphael. Uh, Trump could take eight hours and forty-six minutes, uh, but we weren't. We won't go there. <laughs> we again. My my uh, my goal is to pr provide a safe environment for all those speaking and for all those listening. My goal is that people listening to this, white or black, uh, can relate to the questions. They can answer the questions. They can discuss the questions. They can look inside. They can make things better. We can open conversation and hopefully we're creating an example that shows safe conversation is the way to go. And, and that's, that's where healing begins. So um, my fourth and final guest is uh, one of my favorite people. He is a graduate of uh, what I call the Clarity Summit. He was one of my best football players I've ever coached. He's a father of four. He is a Purple Heart Army veteran. He's an entrepreneur and life coach. Mr. Alan Halliburton, what's up, Halley? Hey, how you doing, coach? My number 54. And uh, Alan and I, we loved each other from the day we met. And uh, just I respect and, and thank you for your service to our country and, for and the sacrifices that you put in. Alan just got back from a battle with COVID. And um, he he was in a coma for how long? Well, that was a diabetic coma that started it. Right. But uh, it was about three days. Uh, crazy. I was unaware, yeah. Yes, just crazy. So uh, I'm glad you're alive. Yeah, hey, me too. Thank, thank God for that. So uh, we're going to go ahead with uh, Alan's 8-minute and 40-second interview. Um, and so, Alan, we'll start with this uh, local Indianapolis guy. I would like to have you share your personal or shared racism experience that affected you in your nervous system deep to your core how old were you when you experienced it and how did it make you feel okay i got a couple of short ones uh the first one i was actually 16 years old uh junior at chatard um and i had asked a girl on a date and uh she says uh well, I can meet you. I was like, well, nah, I'll come pick you up. And she's like, nah, my dad won't let me get in the car with you. Right. And I said, what? I said, I shook your dad's hand at the football game the other day. She said, yeah, you're a football player, but you ain't coming to my house. Right. And so that was just like, wow, okay. You know, Shit is real. Yeah, like, okay, I'm good enough to play football for you, and you can shake my hand and give me a hug after a football game. Right. But I'm not good enough for your daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So that was a major experience. Now, did you know and feel and have racism exist before you were 16? Oh, I've had tons oh, of. Okay, yeah, yeah. but, that was, but that, that was one that hit you over the head. It, it hit me because um, 
the reason I picked Shatard right over other schools was because I I felt that it was a family environment right um I felt you know a bond with a lot of people that I met there and I ha- I I just didn't expect to hear that to get any type of you know racism like that right um so that's why it was a major shock uh, uh, an awakening mm. you know for me mm. give us um, a couple more I know well, you said you had a couple yeah, quick ones. well Didn't the other one dive into that no one. no you're fine the other one is funny because it's about a, a green chevy that I had. <laughs> so uh, I just I had got out of the army. He's uh, got to be a criminal. Yeah, yeah. Look at that damn well, car. Hey, so uh, I had bought a 1990 box Chevy, uh, and that's what they call a dope boy car. Ah. Um, I had just painted it, got it painted uh, a metallic jade. Oh. Uh, I had the interior done and everything, and uh, I was a football coach in Hamilton County. And so. Uh, I'm driving to Hamilton County. I have my football cleats in the car with me, and I get stopped on Hazeldale Road. Mm. Uh, was not speeding, you know, just cruising down the street. You know, uh, officer walks on my car, uh, looks in. I say, you know, how you doing? And he said, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to work. Marion County. Uh, anyway, Hamilton. Right. Yeah, so I said, I'm going to work. And uh, he said, well, where you work at? And I said, the school up here. And he says, uh, uh, what's that What's that uh, debris on the ground? I said, man, that's dirt from my cleats, man. You know, dirt, grass. I'm a football coach. Right. So he goes back to his car. I'm sitting there for about 10 minutes. He comes back over. Uh, forget the question he asked me, but, you know, I'm starting to get nervous. And so I just start naming every police officer that I know. I right. said, hey, man, I work with Jim Leisure. I work with uh, uh, Kevin Jennings. Uh, you know, I, I you know I know all these cops. Right. And so, I ask him for his badge number, to which he says, "Well, how, yeah, how'd that go?" Well, he, he gave me his badge number, uh, but once I started naming the cops, he that kind of shook him. Mm. And so he says, uh, "Well, uh, I'm gonna let you go, but you need to be careful driving this car in this area." Hello. And so, uh, yeah, that 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 messed up my day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the fact that you, need, <clears throat> that you needed to be told that, that, the fact that it needed to be said, and the fact that that's even a reality lets you know that we're not where we need to be, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy, but my guess is these are stories that people don't get, you know? As a black man, you better be careful how you paint your car. And we're, and we're, we're going to show you a one-minute video that shook me to the core when it was, when it was played when Todd sent it to me today. And, I, I mean, I was furious. And we're going to play that after Alan's time. All right, Alan, so uh, thank you for those stories. Now, um, you were in the military. I don't know if you experienced racism in the military or not. Um, but I'm guessing you did. That was what Vic Fangio said. There's no racism in the NFL. I went, hold it, moly. Okay. So um, I'd like to give you extra time. I don't mean to be talking over it. That was something. If you could make a change, right, in law enforcement, in legislation, wherever, what change would you make right now? What would make a difference? So I read a quote. It was this morning, actually, and it said that uh, laws and actions don't change until money gets disrupted. Mm. And so thinking about that, um, every time cops commit crimes or have misconduct trials or anything like that, those trials are paid by the taxpayers. Mm. Um, Between 2011 and 2014, Baltimore taxpayers paid $5.7 million Mm. in uh, misconduct fees uh, geared towards cops. Um, so a change that I would make is instead of the taxpayers paying this, um, we're going to hit the police pensions and retirements. Mm. And, and that's going to cause you to police each other. Right. Because if, if I'm getting close to 20 years, I'm getting close to retirement, and I got Joe Schmo over here wanting to act stupid. Right. And now you're pulling money out of my pension to cover this trial and, and, and to pay you know people that were harmed by, by this. Um, I'm going to step up as an officer and say, you need to cut that out. Right, right. You know. um, That's pretty smart. Very well thought out. 
Did you get that yourself, or did somebody help you with that? Nah, I did that myself. Did you? Did That's myself. pretty good. Uh, be careful running for office with that one. That could that could be very interesting. Um, and again, this isn't this isn't a pile on the cops podcast, right? I mean, this is just conversation that is coming out, but it's conversation that is necessary. And I know that all of us, everyone on here knows cops and we love cops. And there's one, two percent that probably we don't love. And so um, if you are a police officer or in the military, thank you for your service. Alan, what do you think white people need to hear or white people need to do? Uh, accountability. Mm. Um, just, just holding people accountable. Um, and, and that's everybody. You right. know, when, when when you if you see something, you say know, something. say something, do something. Mm-hmm. You know, don't you know? The, the first thing we do is, especially in this era, we pull out the phone and start recording. Right. And I mean that that that's a form of accountability because I can, you know, issue that to to the proper authorities. Um, but you know, you you see people that are they're doing this George Floyd challenge. Right. <clears throat> and, and so, you know, it, you is know, that, what is it? So it's basically, it's, it's, it's basically white people putting laying one, 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 one white person lays down. The other white person puts their knee on his yeah, neck. That is Jack. And they're taking up. the picture. That is Jack. And, and that's happening. Oh and, yeah. That's and, happening. And, and, and they're not getting well, physically abused. Well, and, and even if you know these people, right. You know, say something, you know, what's good. You know, what's right and wrong. Right. You know, I what? can't believe that. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, Lou Holt said it. I only got one rule. Right. Do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And and everybody knows what's right and what's wrong. Right. We don't have to have a, a thousand laws. Just do the right thing. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So wow, that that would piss me off. That pisses me off just thinking about it. So um, talk to me. You got four children. Yes, I do. How old are they? Well, we eighteen, know. sixteen, twelve, and eight. And. Um, you know, we didn't. I know me and you talked about what this effect this is having on black women and mm-hmm. mother of black sons. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on how this is affecting them and how do you feel when your kids go out right. well, see, at nine o'clock at night? Yeah, and, and that's major because that's one thing that people aren't thinking about is, you know, these black women that have these children mm. and they don't, you know, my child is out and. I'm worried every time my child leaves the house because I don't know if they're going to be pulled over like, you know, Todd Fennell was. Right. Are they going to be shot? Mm-hmm. Are they going to be beat? Mm-hmm. All right, we're back after our eight-second pause. All right, Alan Halliburton, thank you. And I want to thank all of my guests. I, what I want to do now is to uh, pull up this video that was sent to me. Um, so if the stories that you were told by these intelligent, smart, influential uh, givers in society, if that did not reach you, if their personal stories didn't reach you, I want you to imagine yourself as a 10-year-old black kid and say, what's the best advice I can give a 10-year-old black kid? And uh, I think, Jason, if you can cue this up, it's uh, th- this is what it's like. Uh, and I wouldn't know, but here we go. Don't put your hands in your pockets. Don't put your hoodie on. Don't be outside with no shirt on. Check in with your people. It don't matter even if you're down the street. Don't be out too late. Don't touch anything you're not buying. Never leave the store without a receipt or a bag, even if it's just a pack of gum. Never make it look like there's an altercation between you and someone else. Never leave the house without your ID. Don't drive with a white beat on. Don't drive with a do-rag on. Don't go out in public with neither. Don't ride with the music too loud. Don't stare at a Caucasian woman. If a cop stop you randomly and start questioning you, don't talk back, just compromise. If you ever get pulled over, hands on the dashboard, and ask, could you get out your license and registration? Damn good advice, yes or no? And we, any, anybody can speak up here. I mean, what does that video say to you? Uh, and we'll start with whoever. George, we haven't seen you in a minute. If you want to chime in, what does that video, how does that feel to you? 
<clears throat> George? Did George head out? George might have headed out. Uh, no, I'm, I'm here. Okay, I'm here. Okay. He's had it muted off. That's cool. Did you get to see that video? Yeah, I did. It, it's powerful. It's, you know, it's heart wrenching to, to, to hear the perspective of our young kids and their voice. And I hear it and see it every day with some of the kids I work with and, and I've um, tried to, to bring into scholars and things like that. It's powerful. What um, what do you think uh, the biggest challenge is as a leader of the educational system for you and for the and for the young black kids that are under you? Um, I just think we have to re-emphasize how important education is to at least you know finish high school and then you know kind of compete in the global marketplace and it doesn't have to necessarily be a college, but it can be a career. It could be plumbing, electrician. We just have to have a solid base. But like I go back to what I had mentioned before, we have to build empathy with all our kids. Service learning, giving back to our community, um, supporting each other in a way that, you know, we just, we've lost our way as a society in, in some aspects where the village is not as strong. I remember being disciplined young <laughs> from my neighbors, or at least having that conversation from the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we just lost our way in that aspect, along with having a police force that has systematically been an issue since we came over. You know what I mean? Sure. And so that, police were actually the original, <laughs> um, when, when, when we had slaves run away, they were original people to go find a slave. So, I mean, those are some of the different things that we have to understand from a systemic point of view about how we educate our kids, support our kids, but then also work like heck to make sure our uh, our law enforcement are understanding and empathetic. George, talk to me about, is there a crisis for minority teachers? Like, do we need more black teachers? What is being done to do that? And, and is there a website or is there something we can do to get more black well, teachers in schools? Well, up in Minnesota, that's been a big issue. I mean, um, there's research that suggests when a kid has a black teacher um, or a black male in front of them, they tend to do better academically and socially. Um, I think there's been a lot of recruitment um, that has a lot of human resources will go to HBCUs to try to recruit um, down south or, you know, um, out east. Um, and so that's been an effort, maybe Chicago. So there's lots of efforts being made, but it's still education. You don't pay well. Right. Um, you don't pay well. I think our educators need to be one of the highest paid professions. They're not paid well. And so you don't get that entry point for a lot of our uh, community or families or people who look like me. Um, so that's tough. Yeah, that's cool. All right, Todd Fennell, tell me uh, when you watched that video, what was going through your head? Yeah, Glenn. So, you know, th that that video is the 2020 version of what many or maybe even most black people know as the talk. Mm. Right. So uh, when when you're growing up, um, your parents give you the talk and wow. they run through the list of things to do or not to do to make sure that you come back home, that to make sure that you come back home. Period. Um, and and I, and I don't have sons. I've got two daughters. Uh, but believe me, the, the talk has been had with 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 my daughters. They're 24 and 21 now, mm. but they remember the talk. Uh, so, so that is the 2020 version of the talk. And that's uh, again, that's reality. So so you, you speak about it, Glenn, in terms of those experiences being in our nervous system. It's it's a part of it's a part of our coping mechanism. It's a part of how we have to. Uh, operate in order to make sure that we come home mm. at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I would be, <clears throat> I, I would be very surprised if uh, there were white families that sat around the dinner table and talked about the talk. Right. So again, I go back to the fact that white privilege is real. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you know, I, I thought when when we were talking about doing this podcast and you had that question. Um, I, I thought I would share that video with you 
help you understand the point I was trying to make in terms of we're, we're not talking about this being a a problem that black people have to solve. Right. Right. Th this is a problem that all of us have, that all of us have to solve. But mo most importantly, white folks need to take more action, in my opinion, than many or most black people. It's 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 about understanding, accepting, operating from the heart, acknowledging that we're on an uneven playing field. Uh, and I yeah, I never got that talk. But I but I do know that you got a grandson. I do. Um, and, and, and as it stands, you know, he, he's four years old. He is mixed race. But at the end of the day, we know that mixed race equals black. Mm -hmm. I have, right? So at, at some point when he's ready, the, the talk will be had with him as well. I have a godson who is mixed race, and his mother constantly is saying, those are the children that can actually change this. Now, I don't know if that's true or if it's not true, but interracial marriage is certainly something that is m way more prevalent than it ever was. And that's a whole nother podcast. Uh, but I am happy. Uh, I love watching you and your grandson. I know you love him to death, and we always Absolutely. will pray for his safety. Raphael, tell me what you thought of that video, and what did that bring up for you? Well, I thought it was real talk. Yeah. Um, it's a damn shame that parents have to do that, but it's real. Mm-hmm. Um, because the irony is if you don't have those communications, we get George Floyd situations. Right. And I think if you talk to, if we took 100 black people and said or asked them, were you surprised about what happened to George Floyd? They'd, be, mm. they'd say no. Right. All like of them. Zero. A hundred out of a hundred. Exactly. And then if we ask the second question of how many of you believe that the police officers will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law? Right. I question how many of them would say, yeah, I believe that because this is not new. Mm-mm. And we've even had videotaped right. situations very similar to this, and nothing happens. Right. So, like I said, it's it's a shame that you have to do that, but you know, once you decide to have kids and you're a person of color, it has to happen. Right. Right. It's um, uh, it it I sent Todd. I I, I was sent. Um, uh, another video, which I, hopefully you got, Todd, of the exact same chokehold on another black guy who, and I don't know if he died or not, but um, it is happening. That the thought is, which is the real question, is the the fervor, the attention, the awakening is at an all time high. But in ten days, when something happens, is it all just going to go back down? I mean, is and that's what Obama was talking about. And, and that's what I said in the podcast, which spawned all this. I said, does Joe Biden not understand the opportunity in front of him? I mean, like he should be on TV or or any leader, Mayor Joe Hogg said. I'm sitting there going, how can he not be on TV, you know, in the middle creating things it, it, as a politician? But, you know, they got to get votes and it's Indiana. So maybe that's the way it is. And then um, one of my mentors is Trent Shelton. I would encourage any of you guys watch Ch Trent Shelton. Trent's got about 7 million followers. Trent is black man. He is real. And his message was, don't, if you're white, don't do nothing, right? Doing nothing is not good. And, and number two, everybody, black and white, it starts with you. And he said, when I, my kid, when I become a grandfather, when they talk about George Floyd in 2020, I don't want to look at him and say, I didn't do anything. And so that's what hit me over the head. And I said, damn, Trent, I need to get the Get Attitude podcast going. I was up all night thinking about the, the format of this and the context, because I hope that this is the start of something um, for a lot of people, whoever's listening out there. Uh, that you you take this form and you go interview people for eight minutes and twenty four or eight minutes and forty six seconds. Al, Hallie, let's finish with you. What did that video mean to you? And you had mentioned a lot of your boys out on the East Coast are like, man, is this going to be a conspiracy thing or what's going on with that? So, clue me a little bit what that conversation was about. Yeah. Um, so mm. I, I I received a talk very similar to that, and I have boys myself. Uh, right. my two oldest are boys um, 
and I'm not going to say that I've talked to them like that. Their mothers tend to handle <laughs> that. Um, because I, this is something that we shouldn't have to talk about. Mm. And I'm not blind to the fact. You know, it's just that it angers me to talk to my children like that. Mm. You know, like, I, you know, I, I, you know, hey, you can't, hey, put, put your T-shirt on because you got that beater on. Right. And you can't drive around the corner to get something. Right. You know. That ain't, it ain't right. right. It ain't right. You know, and I and I shouldn't and I shouldn't have to do that. Right. That's not a free society. You know? Right? No, negative. <laughs> right. Negative. Um Yeah, no, uh boys on the East Coast, uh you know, it's a lot of conspiracy theories going on and everybody, you know, they just you know, they're like, Hey, you know, is this show you know, geared towards a conspiracy theory, you know, and I'm like, nah, this is this is <clears throat> black men telling their stories cool. telling their life you know a hey, race you know things that happen to them racial experiences right um I, I will say i don't it's a lot of interracial i'm sorry i'm, I'm jumping to a different topic because it was something that That's you said okay. that stuck to yeah, me yeah, where yeah, you're yeah, saying yeah. uh the interracial the, the biracial kids are, are the kids that can save this or or make a, a big change right um there's a, a lot of biracial kids in my family. Right. And, and I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I think that right now, these 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 kids, these young adults are, are actually causing that change right now. Social media is causing that change because, you know, racism's always been there. It's all, you know, this has been happening forever. Mm. But now to have it on your TV. Right. Where, you know, the, the thing is, is we, we know black people were, were dying from cop killings. Right. But to actually sit there and watch it, that's a totally different experience. Mm-hmm. And and to have that at the forefront is what's going to cause this change. Um, and and it, it ain't just the, the, the mixed kids. It's, it's the fact that you have black and white people doing it. Because it's been black people protesting forever. But now that you have white people actually out there holding Black Lives Matter signs. Right. You got white people a lot out of there them. doing that. Talk. Yeah, and that's what a I'm saying. A lot of them. You, at hell, you look at TV sometimes, it's more white people out there protesting than black people. Right. You know, in certain locations. And you got uh, brothers out in, in California, your Mexican or Hispanic, I'm sorry, Hispanic brothers out there, you know, where a population has 2% black people. Right. But they're out there like, hey, we're tired of this. You got your brothers in Toronto mm-hmm. and London. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it's... It's the fact that we have this and we're seeing it live, right? You know, and, and that's what's going to be the change of this. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the unmasking of racism, right? Uh, we all had our masks on. COVID hit. We got our masks on, but it's time to unmask racism. Social media is doing it. Uh, I want to respect the time of our viewers. I could I could I could go on for four hours, but then our message would be diluted. And I think uh, George, Todd, Raphael, and Alan. Uh, you serve George Floyd's uh, remembrance in his life, in his memory, in the eight minutes and 46 seconds that he was not able to talk um, very well. And I hope that uh, you were inspired by whatever hopefully he brought to this podcast and that I hope the 846 that you got to speak changed a little bit of something in you. But more importantly, I hope that it changes, it changes everybody that listens to this podcast. I ask... That if you liked what you heard, that you share this podcast, that you send it to people that need to hear it, and uh, most of all, that you uh, find these people on social media and thank them for uh, putting their time in today. And so, George, Todd, Raphael, and Alan, thank you so much for being here on the Get Attitude podcast. God bless you all, and may your families stay very, very safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Thanks, guys. The 846 interviews stories of black America on the Get Attitude podcast.